están todos? Saturno está gobernando las noches en el mes de agosto y es por eso que en la Universidad Galileo quisimos hacer una conferencia sobre este planeta, pero hacer una conferencia muy especial y con alguien realmente especial, alguien que nos hablara de Saturno, que nos hablara de los anillos de Saturno, pero que nos hablara con toda propiedad. Es así como nuestro invitado de hoy, eh, el astrónomo Stephen James Omeara, eh, es quien nos va a platicar sobre sus propios descubrimientos en los anillos de Saturno. Stephen eh, James Omeara es un astrónomo reconocido mundialmente, mundialmente. Eh, y básicamente, eh, por hechos muy importantes, por su vista, que es una vista extraordinaria, una vista mejor que la de cualquier persona, eh, que le ha acreditado el, el sobrenombre de los ojos más poderosos del mundo, imagínese usted, y también por su gran dedicación a la observación. Es un observador eh, extraordinario. Para hablar de eso, les voy a comentar que fue la primera persona que observó el cometa Halley cuando regresó en 1985, y para eso se tuvo que subir a, a la montaña de Mauna Kea, al volcán apagado, a, a unos 4,600 metros de altura, que con un telescopio que no era un telescopio de un observatorio profesional, era un, observa es un telescopio de aficionado, de, y logró visualizar el cometa Halley entre un campo de muchos puntos pequeñitos, cuando tenía magnitud 19.6, imagínese usted, magnitud 19.6, y logró visualizarlo, y él estaba junto con astrónomos profesionales como Jay Pasakoff, que confirmaron la posición del cometa y por eso él tiene el crédito de haber recuperado, así se llama, recuperado el cometa Halley en 1985-86 cuando, cuando retornó, su último retorno. Pero no solo eso, Steven ha calculado antes de que se tuvieran los datos confirmados por Voyager y por el telescopio espacial y muchas otras eh, misiones, calculó también con sus propias observaciones visuales el periodo de rotación del planeta Urano eh, con un telescopio de la Universidad de Harvard en 1981. Y el periodo eh, que le dio fue sumamente parecido al actual. Y eso observando desde desde precisamente desde el observatorio de Harvard. Y luego posteriormente a esto, eh, también tiene otro gran éxito. Usando ese telescopio de la Universidad de Harvard en los años 70, 70, en el 76 en adelante, él hizo varias observaciones de unas misteriosas sombras o líneas que se ven en los anillos de Saturno, especialmente el anillo B. Y era tan increíble que alguien pudiera estar observando eso, que los astrónomos profesionales eh, eh, al principio se mostraron escépticos. No, no creían que esto era cierto, que alguien pudiera observar desde la Tierra este, esta, este tipo de, de, de sombras en los anillos de Saturno. Es, era algo que decían, esto es imposible. Sin embargo, en 1980, cuando las Voyager pasaron sobrevolaron el planeta Saturno, confirmaron la existencia de, los, de, los, de las líneas radiales que se forman en estos anillos y quedó precisamente confirmada la observación de Steven Omeara. Eh, sus dibujos eh, coinciden exactamente con las fotografías que tomaron en las misiones espaciales. Steven, aparte de de estos logros espectaculares, es autor de varios libros. Aquí tengo algunos. Toda esta colección eh, es, es, eh, son libros que él ha escrito. Aquí tengo este, por ejemplo, Hidden Treasures. De, de, es, estos son libros que tienen mucha información sobre objetos de cielo profundo, pero es un detalle tremendo el que tiene. Y miren qué cantidad de páginas para los que les encanta cielo profundo. Steven es autor de este libro que se llama Hidden 
Treasures es autor también del de libro eh, de Messier Objects, que es eh, todos los objetos de Messier, todo el catálogo de Messier. Si uno quiere verlo en detalle, aquí lo podemos ver es objeto por objeto. También es autor de otro libro muy interesante que se llama The Caldwell Objects, que está acá, aquí lo muestro, y también tiene una serie de, de detalles por cada uno de, de, los, de los objetos en donde él muestra, él habla de sus propias observaciones de cada uno de estos objetos. No, no son... Eh, Digamos, está personalizado, está personalizado con las observaciones que él hizo de estos objetos. Así que son unas joyas estos libros, son unas verdaderas joyas para quien los quiera coleccionar. Además, escribió sobre Marte, escribió, este es el primer libro que escribió sobre Marte y acaba de escribir otro más actualizado, que, cuyo, cuyo autor es solamente él. También escribió sobre... Eh, las noches de Botsuana, porque hoy está radicado en Botsuana y desde ahí nos va a platicar en Botsuana, en África. Y hay libros como el que está acá o el que está acá, que son de autores que hablan de Steven. Y entonces, eh, esto, esto, con esto lo que quiero contarles es que estamos ante una personalidad fuera de serie. Y por eso quisimos eh, presentárselos hoy para que nos hable él de sus propios descubrimientos. Así que, sin más, quiero saludar a Steven y, y presentarlo. Steven, how are you? Great, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> I was telling the audience uh, about you and your achievements, and yes. uh, thank you. We are, the, we are very excited at the University of Galileo to have you here, and, and thank you for your time and giving us this lecture. And uh, thank you for for being here. Uh, you are in Botswana, right? Yes. Uh, yes, so, Mount Botswana. Oh, Mount Botswana. Perfect. Yes. So uh, I leave you to to start your your lecture and and appreciate your time. Yes. Thank you so much, Edgar. It's a pleasure to be here. This also, I hope um, the the talk is is of interest to many because it's it's really something that is still an ongoing area of research and i i want to start off really by talking about rings in general so when our solar system first began we had our sun and in a sense we had our own ring of debris around the sun which over time became small particles that co-joined to form the planets. And here we have Mercury, Venus, and Earth. And you can see they're just uh, uh, in orbit around the sun and Mercury goes faster than Venus around the sun and Venus goes faster in its orbit around the sun than does the Earth and so on and so forth. Now, we have other planets in the solar system that have rings, um, including Jupiter, Uranus, and Neptune. So not only does Saturn have rings, but there are other the gas giant planets have them as well. And in fact, recently in 2014, there was an asteroid, Chericolo, which they believe has a ring around it of icy debris. And this was discovered using stellar occultations Um, so rings are sort of uh, part and parcel for many of the planets in our solar systems. It's even possible that our Earth and the other terrestrial planets might have had rings of debris around them at some point in their history. But none of them compare to Saturn's. Saturn's rings are just glorious. They're magnificent. They're, they are a wonder at anyone who's ever looked through a telescope even the smallest of telescopes will show the rings. All the other planets, the rings are too faint to see visually. To get an appreciation for them, Saturn's rings consist mostly of water ice fragments and they're mixed with rocky matter and debris. Now, these particles range in size from less than a grain of sand to as large as mountains. 
Now, to put this all in perspective, especially the mountain aspect, Saturn itself is huge. Um, you can fit 21 Earths across the entire length of the rings, and you can take a look at Earth itself. So comparatively, these particles are small compared to Saturn itself. And the rings themselves are a wonder because they're extremely thin. I mean, they're 250,000 kilometers in width, yet they're only 1.5 kilometers in, in, in thickness. Now, if you were to take all the matter in, that, in those rings and compress it, all the matter, 250,000 kilometers, of matter and compress it, all that material would fit within an area of about 100 kilometers across, which is about half the area of Guatemala City. So we see the rings in their glory, and it's all reflected sunlight shining off these relatively small particles. And at one point, we thought the rings were very old, probably as old as Saturn itself. But recent research now is tends toward believing that the rings are only 100 million years old. So that puts it around the area of the uh, Jurassic era on Earth. So the rings are relatively young. Not only that, but new thinking uh, believed that the rings might have been formed by a comet that flew too close to Saturn or even like a large asteroid had a collision with the moon and it was approached too close to the planet and the debris uh, broke up and was contained in an orbit around Saturn itself. And finally, in this short overview, Turns out that Cassini found that the rings actually have an atmosphere. And it's composed of little molecules of oxygen. So as water, as sunlight hits the water in the rings, it splits the oxygen, you know, creating hydrogen and atomic oxygen. And so the rings themselves have, have their own atmosphere. Now, we're going to be talking, Saturn has many rings. These are it's comprised of countless ringlets. And there are even more rings than you see here that are exterior to the, these rings. But the three main rings that we can see through a telescope is the outer A ring, the middle B ring, and the dim crepe ring or this inner C ring. Now the ring B is the brightest of all of these. Now, I first found the, the radio markings in Saturn's B-ring in um, 1976. I was only 19 years old, and I was using, at first, the 15-inch refractor at Harvard, which you see at left, and then moved on to the 9-inch refractor. Now, I'm going to escape from this screen just to show you uh, the spokes. These drawings, these are in November 1976, they're just these really hyperfine markings that you see here. And then you can see some here. This was a, a month later. And notice how they're not, they, you don't see them on this area on the, on the opposite end. So just on one side, that's where I predominantly saw them. And not only that, but this is just two observations of, uh, of a series that I've made over the course of four years. Um, at the time, it was thought that spokes in Saturn's rings were impossible. And we'll talk about why, we'll, we'll see why. But it was in 1980 when Voyager went out to Saturn and it saw these dark radial markings in ring B and confirmed the observations that I had made earlier. And in fact, it turns out that even uh, observers in the 19th century had also seen them as well. One of the reasons that the, and probably the prime reason no one believed that they could exist was because the spokes cross ring B radially. So Saturn's rings are not like the spokes in a wagon wheel 
which stay and as the wheel rotates, the spokes rota rotate with them. That's fine, but Saturn's rings are made up of very small particles and they're orbiting at different speeds. So the innermost particles are moving faster around Saturn than the outermost particles. So they believe that anything that would go across the rings radially would be torn apart by shear forces. And just to give you an example, if we just take a second here, you can see how the moons, in a second, you'll see them move. You can see how the inner moons are moving much more faster than the outer moons. And so for this reason, they thought the spokes could not exist because nothing could cross the rings radially without being torn apart. Yet we know that they do exist. Now this, this is um, a Voyager video showing the ro rotation of the spokes and you'll see how they do not tear apart, but they stay the same. So really mysterious, shadowy looking features and no one could understand what would be causing them. Now, what's interesting is that 10 years after Voyager, Hubble Space Telescope achieved Earth orbit and began looking for the spokes. And when it turned to Saturn, it couldn't see spokes. There was nothing there. Then in 1996, I was atop uh, Mauna Kea and I was helping use the uh, 3.6 meter Canada, France, Hawaii telescope. And one of the objects we turned it onto was Saturn. So six years after the Hubble observation, we've recovered the spokes and I'll, oops, sorry. I'm just going to um, go back. Let me just do this again. No, nope, sorry, bear with me. <laughs> okay. Here we go. So you can see the spokes here, there are at least five that return. Now they, this was using an adaptive optic system um, for the first time on this large telescope. And these are probably among the first observations, recorded observations of the spokes from Earth. Um, and Four days later, the Hubble Space Telescope imaged, imaged the, the spokes as well. So it looked like the spokes were back in 1996. Then in 1998, the spokes disappeared. Equally mysterious, when the Cassini spacecraft arrived at Saturn in 2004, it still didn't see any spokes. So this was a grave mystery as to why the spokes would appear sometimes, not appear at other times. Then the spokes were expected to return in 2017, but they, um, I'm sorry, uh, whatever that was, but they returned early in, in uh, 2005, not 2007, when the ring ang angle was uh, plus 20 degrees. So you can see them very faintly here these bright streaks. And this, we'll talk about why the spokes appear bright in these images a little bit later. So now the spokes return early. And so we have questions as to what's going on, what are the spokes and how do they form? And this is basically the answer because we don't know. I don't know. We know a few things about the spokes. Um, we know that they're collections of dust and ice particles that scatter light from the sun differently than they do the rings themselves. We know that they're about less than a micron in size. And so that's about 1 50th the width of a human hair. So if you could split a human hair 50 times, the, the, the particles are that thin. And we know that they can form in the time it takes you to eat breakfast and then disappear before you sit down for lunch. 
So the very temporal features. Some spokes say they watched them go around for three revolutions, but the vast majority of the spokes are very temporal features. Now, they appear dark on the rings when we're looking with bats, backscattered light. So let's say the spacecraft is has the sun behind the craft looking down on the rings, then the sunlight reflecting off the particles back to the eye or the, to the eye of the camera, the particles appear dark. Now we have forward scattering, the, the spokes appear bright in the rings. And that's when, let's say Cassini spacecraft goes underneath the rings, is looking at the spokes in the direction of the sun. And then, so in the forward scattering light, we see them appearing bright. So this tells us that these are small particles and that they being somehow, they're electrically charged and they're levitating above the ring plane. So the very small particles, but they're above the ring plane and they're scattering sunlight. Now, how does that happen? How do they levitate? And the, one of the theories is that it's by static electricity. And essentially it's once, I can escape, once, so this would be the evening, once the ring particles enter the near absolute zero temperatures of Saturn's shadow of the planet cast onto the rings, the particles, when they enter sunlight, get a static discharge. So just like if you were to zap your finger uh, on a, a metal doorknob as you rub your feet against the carpet. So it's, it's that static discharge that levitates the particles temporarily above the rings. So Maya Mace says the exact mechanisms and physical environment leading to their formation and propagation is still shrouded in mystery. Several theories have been proposed. None can fully explain the appearance of the spokes. And this is the way it stands today. Now, there are a number of theories, and I'm going to basically summarize the theories in, in a simplistic form. I'm they're, they're, the actual theories, I'm sure, are, are embedded in nuances, and uh, I, we're not going into, into that, but this is just, again, a, a simple overview. And I'm not, also I have to tell you, I'm not one working on the theories of spoke formation. Um, so we just hit from here, we'll start with what we know. And we know that static electricity levitates the particles. So the question is what happens once they're levitated? And scientists think that the electromagnetic forces are responsible, usually a repulsion force. So something is causing two negatives to, to cause the spokes to levitate. The repulsive electromagnetic force is causing the particles to rise above the ring plane. No one knows the detailed theories, nothing has been worked out. Now we do know that as I showed you in my drawings that I made from Harvard, I'm going to escape here. You can see the spokes are on the morning part of the rings. They're called the answer, the morning answer of the rings. The, the spokes are more prominent and they're hardly visible and rarely here do they survive on this side. They do make it to this side and when they do, they're much fainter than they are when on the morning answer. So the spokes are more prominent in the morning answer than they are on the evening answer. Now, one theory is that when the particles get levitated above the ring plane, they're actually captured by Saturn's magnetic field lines. Now for this, then they can rotate with the magnetic field lines. And by doing this, the spokes rotate with the planet instead of rotating with the rings. So in other words, this explains why the spokes are not torn apart. It's because they're not in the ring plane rotating at different speeds. They're actually above the ring plane 
rotating with the magnetic field line. So the rotation period of Saturn is 10 hours, and this is what ha that happens to be the rotation period for the spokes. That also was the rotation period that I achieved visually in 1976, that during the four year period that I was monitoring the spokes. Now, the reason they believe the spokes are more prominent on the morning side of the rings is because this is when they're uplifted. And then over time, as the, the, the particles are moving with the magnetic field lines, they gradually snow back down onto the ring plane. So over the course of the 10 hours, they will lift and then gradually fall back down into the ring plane. So that's why they're less distinct on the evening side. So all of this to me makes perfect sense. Other explanations is that they're caused by swarms of meteorites. And you know, Saturn is the second largest planet in the solar system and it is continually capturing objects and small bodies can be easily uh, thrown into Saturn's ring plane. Now, the belief was that these um, meteorite swarms could cause a sudden charged dust plasma environment. Um, and this would be a temporary event in which you would have the electrical charge that would build up and create the spokes. But it doesn't, this would be something that would happen quickly. And it doesn't explain why we see the spokes building gradually in intensity and then fading over time. Um, we, the Cassini has actually imaged particles entering parts of the outer rings of Saturn and you can see some of the shadowing effects that look spoke-like. But here's something I want to show you. Cassini captured some meteorite particles. You see them uh, here as a bright streak across the, uh, across the ring. Now, I'm going to show you again. So here, so you can see the, the streak. Now, these particles, you see, first of all, they're spread out, not they're spread out along the the um, they're they're more or less parallel with the rings. They're not extending radially. And if you look what happens, give me a sec. If you look what happens to a ring particle when it first strikes the ring, it's circular. And as soon as the particle um, strikes the rings and the debris, it breaks into a bunch of debris. Watch what happens. It spreads out, just as you saw in, in a elongated form. And this is caused by shear forces. This is because of all the different speeds that the rings, for which the rings are rotating, uh, are creating this long, uh, turning, the, turning this pinpoint into a long needle-like, projection. And, but this differs from the spoke creation because the spokes are not affected by shear forces. Not only that, but Cassini was able to record these impacts in all of the rings, ring A, ring B, and ring C, but the spokes only occur in ring B. So there are, there are questions, and again, there, I'm sure there are plenty of nuances for those who are working on this model. I may not be doing it 100% justice, but uh, these are questions, at least, that I came up with that, that I have. But they do know that the spokes, uh, are, you know, are formed from a plasma density. So it means that the spokes form when there's a high concentration of ionized gas particles on the ring. And the one thing they know is that the plasma density on Saturn is tied to its ring angle. And as you can see that as Saturn goes around the sun and as the earth goes around the sun, we always see Saturn from a different angle over time. Now it turns out that wherever the plasma, plasma density is highest occurs when the, the rings are 20 degrees open or less. So that's, so in other words, Saturn's rings can open up to about 27 degrees, but the 
plasma density is only is highest when the rings are 20 degrees or nearly edge on. And that occurs during the spring and fall equinoxes on the planet. And it turns out that basically the spokes have been seen when the ring angles were open 20 degrees or less. Um, when the Saturn's rings are wide open, as I said, you can get uh, be as open as 27 degrees um, during the winter and summer, the plasma density is lowest and it appears that the spokes also are not visible. So again, the, the spokes occur when the plasma density is highest, when the rings are 20 degrees open or less. And Carolyn Porco um, in Arizona, who, who is, has been working digitally on the spokes, has come up with a theory that we have eight years of spoke observations. So when the rings are nearly edge on, up to about 20 degrees open, we have spoke observations. Then we have about six or seven years when we cannot see the spokes. And that's when the plasma density is lowest and the rings are opening to their widest. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so again, the, the spokes appear to be seasonal and, and really dealing and occurring around the time of the equinoxes. So we have another theory, and that is uh, that they are caused by sprites, which are stratospheric, mesospheric perturbations resulting from intense thunderstorm electrification. And you know, sprites are just these weird electrical bursts that occur above thunderstorms. Now, these were once thought to be impossible, and um, and a lot of people like pilots and so on who had seen them were afraid to report them because they thought people thought they would be crazy for seeing these weird ghostly glowing jellyfish in the sky that would occur for only fractions of a second. Well, it turns out that it's possible that Saturnian sprites could be the cause of the spokes. Um, they found that in Voyager spacecraft as early as the 80s, found that the spokes came and went with periodic bursts of electromagnetic radiation. Um, and it came from, again, Saturn's magnetic field lines. So it appears that when electrical storms at mid latitudes, they can send out electrons to ring B, which rotates at the same speed of the planet. And again, as we talked about, the magnetic field lines then trap these uh, material and they rotate. But the, the energy source may actually be these high um, latitude storms. Now, this is actual um, from Cassini. Those are actual sounds of lightning storms on Saturn. They're releasing about 10,000 times more energy than Earth storms, which can cause sprites. And so the idea is that you can see in this first frame in upper left, the green light is a cosmic ray that is coming down that, that triggers an electron avalanche, which hits the rings. That's the upper right hand corner. The yellow arrows coming up are the magnetic field lines. And when the cosmic ray hits, hits the ring plane, it creates this repulsion force, which causes the dust particles to jump up, get trapped in the magnetic field lines and then they rotate with Saturn. So again, it's another possible theory. And again, here's some Cassini images. You know, Cassini in, in 20, uh, 2008 recorded the longest lasting lightning storm ever and occurred for eight months. And the same time we had spoke production. And here you have spokes occurring in 2010 when the largest storm ever recorded in the solar system that was three billion watts in one second also a time of uh, fantastic spoke production and the idea and i love the idea of this of the sprites because i just think isn't it incredible how sprites which scientists once thought were illusions may not only appear in Saturn, but also may be the cause of spokes, which scientists once thought could not exist. Now, 
it turns out that this is the perfect time as I wrap this up, that the spoke season is upon us because in August 2021, the ring angles are now at plus 18 degrees and they're heading toward uh, edge on in 2025. So right now we're in the spoke season. But as, as we have seen, the spokes have, are mysterious and to this day, um, they, we haven't seen them. They could have been seen as early as last year when the rings were open at 20 degrees. And so far as I know, up to date, I looked yesterday and I haven't seen any announcements. I hadn't seen anyone claiming observations, not from Earth or from space. Um, so it's, a, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens uh, in the coming years. So maybe even in the coming months, we may be seeing news reports about that spokes are back. So let's keep our fingers crossed. And hopefully before 2025, we'll see if this uh, latest theory holds true. Up until now, this is a weird phenomena. We don't have the full story on it yet. So stand by for more information. Thank you so much.